For today's video, I set myself the task of finding the cheapest possible synthesizer on eBay and using it to record a folk song. The rule was that it had to use some sort of synthesis to produce its sounds, so no modern keyboards where everything is a digital sample, but beyond that it simply had to be as cheap as possible no matter what the quality of the keyboard was. And this is what I found, the Yamaha Portasound PSS20. Firstly I want to emphasise just how tiny this keyboard is. The PSS models all have miniature keys, but this one seems to have even smaller keys than the other models in the range. There's also not a huge amount to the instrument other than the key mechanism and these three pads on the left hand side. All of the features of the keyboard are accessed by holding down either the blue or green pad and pressing the corresponding key on the keyboard. Not only does the keyboard not have any separate control buttons, it also doesn't have an input for mains power or any way to get audio out of it other than the single speaker, until I modified it to have a line output. There's also no structural metal anywhere in it. The whole thing is made of plastic, including the key mechanism. The keyboard is entirely monophonic. No matter what you do, it only plays one note at a time. It can play a drum beat along with that note, but there's no ability to play chords of any description or even to play along with the demo tunes. The synthesis is an incredibly primitive square wave system. It only has eight sounds, so I may as well demonstrate all of them. None of them sound even remotely like what they're called, but I'll refer to them by the names that they're given. The first sound is sax. Then violin. Oboe. Clarinet. Piano. Vibes. The last two sounds are a bit different, because instead of sounding a single note they play a sort of tremolo pattern, so I won't try to play a melody with them because it just won't work. Here's banjo. And marimba, which has notes in alternating octaves. I'm not really sure how these last two sounds are intended to be used. You can play single staccato notes, but you have to be very careful not to hold the key down for too long. If you want to use them for a continuous tremolo of a longer note, you'd want some way of varying the speed of the tremolo to match the tempo of the piece that you're playing, and it can't do that. You get tremolo at one speed, and one speed only. There are two effects that can be applied to the sound, sustain and vibrato. Some of the sounds default to having these on, and some of them to having them off, but you can choose to have either, or both, enabled or disabled for any sound. The vibrato is particularly useful for covering up the fact that none of the notes on the instrument are precisely in tune. They're not far out enough that you'd really notice it, especially with only playing one note at a time, but they're not perfect. Of course, this is the same technique used to conceal the tuning limitations of the Hammond organ, so it's hardly limited to just really cheap keyboards. There are eight built-in rhythms, and the drum sounds are no more realistic than the melody sounds. I won't play them all, but here's 8 beat, 16 beat, samba, and waltz. The tempo can be varied in pretty coarse steps, as can the volume, and the keyboard can be transposed up and down by up to six semitones. Of course, a monophonic keyboard can't play chords, so instead you get the auto arpeggio function, which allows you to play arpeggios in a similar way to the single key chords on other keyboards. You can play a major arpeggio by touching the root note, or a minor one by also touching any key to the left of the root note at the same time, but there's no way to play sevenths or minor sevenths. There is the ability to record a melody and play it back, although it doesn't have a huge memory. I'm not sure exactly how much it can store, but apparently not enough for a full verse of any of the folk songs I tried. The final feature is the musical game. After a short introduction, the keyboard plays notes randomly going up or down one semitone at a time. The objective is to press the corresponding key on the keyboard. Supposedly it's intended to help with ear training, but in practice it's pretty much impossible to know what the note is unless you have perfect pitch, because there's absolutely no feedback unless you press the right key. You'd want it to at least play the note that you pressed so you could listen for how far out you are, but it doesn't do that. So now it's time for my folk song arrangement. I thought an upbeat tune would fit best with the characteristics of this keyboard, but it turns out that the keys are so tiny and slow to respond that it's really difficult to play anything upbeat with any degree of precision. So I've chosen a slower song, Begalior Gwyneth Gwyn, or Watching the White Wheat. 
This song is reckoned to be one of the most beautiful of all the Welsh folk songs, but my version certainly isn't. So what do we make of this keyboard? Well, clearly it's not a high quality instrument, but then toy keyboards rarely are, but they're usually more capable and sound better than this. I wasn't able to find any information about how much this would have cost when it was new in 1989, but it's clear that it was built to a price. The design of the controls is clearly a way to make it as cheap as possible without having to pay for any more buttons than was strictly necessary. It was presumably intended to compete with similarly basic toy keyboards such as the Casio VL Tone. If we look inside the keyboard, we can see that there's barely anything in here. This single chip does basically everything, from scanning the keyboard matrix, to synthesis, to storing the demo tunes and the recorded melody. It's clearly a custom design and only seems to exist within this particular model of keyboard. The only other chip in here is the amplifier. And yet there are clearly plenty of features on this keyboard that they didn't have to include if price was the only consideration. Even if it didn't increase the manufacturing costs, someone would have had to have taken the time to design the auto arpeggio feature, and the game, and the transposition controls, and so on. If all they cared about was getting the cheapest possible product out the door as quickly as possible, they wouldn't have bothered with those features. In a way, the keyboard reminds me of products like the Sinclair Scientific Calculator, which was a really bad scientific calculator, but it cost a fraction of what the competitors' calculators cost. The story of how it was designed and how they managed to fit an entire scientific calculator onto an inexpensive chip that could barely do four-function arithmetic is really interesting from a technical perspective, and I think something similar probably happened with this keyboard. It's less a case of how cheap can we make it, and more how much keyboard can we cram into this impossibly small budget. Anyway, I hope that was interesting. Please do like the video and subscribe if you'd like to see more from me, and thanks for watching.